But thanks for coming out, everyone. Thanks to CHD Multnomah for having me out, and Stephanie and Gail. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And I have the great responsibility and the great pleasure to share uh, a very important topic with you tonight. So I'd like to dive into that. Technology willing. <laughs> There we go. Okay, well, I want tonight to be a little bit lively and engaging. Normally I say Q&A at the end, but I think it's, I think I want to experiment mixing it in tonight. So if you come up with a question in the middle, raise your hand. I'll do my best to manage that. Do you guys see the screen okay? Do you want yeah. to No, like that is perfect. So like that. Okay. Yeah. That's nice. I don't speak up. Yeah, it's visible. That's not. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll do my best to manage this and manage that, and we'll try and keep this train moving along. I did want to start off with a compelling title, provocative title, and picture. This is a picture I actually took with a lot of irony in it, a cell phone tower in a cemetery. <laughs> I think there's a metaphor in there somewhere. Um, oh, and if you wouldn't mind turning your cell phone off while we're here, putting it in airplane mode, I think all of our brains and bodies will appreciate that. You may absorb a little bit more from the material. Just quickly about me, I'm an Oregon native. I am what's known as an electromagnetic radiation specialist, certified by the Building Biology Institute. My job is to identify and remediate electromagnetics, or EMFs, in people's homes. And I've been doing that in the Pacific Northwest since 2017 or so. And I also have the uh, pleasure of working with a nonprofit in the area called Oregon for Safer Technology, which we'll get more into later. But you've probably never heard of building biology, so let me just tell you about that for a second. It came over from Germany in the late 80s, and it is a discipline that looks to create healthy homes, schools, offices, even vehicles. Um, from things like toxic air, uh, contaminants in the water, and even electromagnetic radiation. People like me, building biologists, work with the general public, and then we work with professionals like doctors, naturopaths, real estate professionals, contractors, builders, to help everyone see the relationship between the built environment and the natural world. And that is all we need to say about that. There is a, a growing network of building biologists uh, across the country, which is pretty exciting. So if you have a relative in another part of the country, um, you can probably find someone like me out there to help them out. But I wasn't always this guy, waving around weird equipment in the air and making people do double takes. Once upon a time, I was actually a firefighter paramedic, and it was a career that I worked really hard to get into and loved and made a lot of sacrifices and my family made a lot of sacrifices and then I got sick when I started doing that work. I had brain fog, I had insomnia, <coughs> body aches, pains, you know, really high anxiety, um, eye strain, ringing in the ears, tinnitus in the ears and it got so bad that I was just a wreck when I came home from 24-hour shift and I saw the writing on the wall and eventually had to leave that career behind and it was really heartbreaking but I started to put some pieces together about this EMF thing I've been hearing about and I thought oh well I'm up all night under artificial lighting I've got a cell phone a pager a walkie-talkie maybe that had something to do with it the light bulb started to go off right and then not even five years later my mom who's in the middle contracted a very aggressive form of brain cancer called glioblastoma and was taken from us very quickly. And looking back on her life and her relationship with technology, always talking to all of her friends with the cell phone right here, iPad on her nightstand, power line 20 feet outside of her second story window, more things clicked into place for me and it, it solidified that this EMF had a strong relationship to health, and, and my mom's relationship with technology had played a large part in her contracting this brain tumor. 
Uh, at that point, I was pretty heartbroken, right? And I had some of this knowledge about EMF, I had some personal experiences, and I wanted to help. I wanted to raise awareness, so I found the Building Biology Institute, and away we went. And then more recently, um, as my daughters, who are there on the right, entered the public school system, I became concerned again, because they're exposed in the classroom to commercial grade Wi-Fi, and in the district that my daughters attend, in Lake Oswego, seven out of the 11 school properties have a cell tower on or within 100 feet of the property. And so I became really, really concerned. It was kind of ironic to me that, you know, in certain states, firefighters have protections from cell towers being placed near the fire station, but we don't have this for school kids on school grounds. <clears throat> So that's how I got into this. What are we talking about when, when we say EMF, electromagnetic radiation? You may have seen this in a high school physics class, but this is the electromagnetic spectrum. It's how energy goes from point A to point B in the universe, and there's a lot of different forms that can do that. Listed at the bottom are maybe some common man-made devices that operate on certain parts of the spectrum. This is really what we're talking about when we say electromagnetic radiation. Professor Ollie Johansson, you may have heard of him, he's pretty prominent in the EMF space, but he has estimated that we've added 10 to the 18th power of man-made radiation into the environment since 130 years ago or so, and that's a one and then 18 zeros. So compared to what was around before, we have blown that out of the water with what we've put into our environment. <clears throat> Dr. Paul, Dr. Martin Paul, is another prominent EMF researcher. Uh, he had a quote. I don't want to get too sciencey tonight, put anybody to sleep, but I really want to share this. I'm just going to paraphrase it. But he's talking about the difference between natural EMFs, like the sun, Schumann resonance, and then all the stuff that we've created. And he said, um, Electronically generated EMFs are generated in a, in a coherent state at a specific frequency, vector, phase, and polarity. These coherent EMFs put out vastly stronger electrical forces than do most natural EMFs, which are incoherent. So man-made EMFs are taking these wavelengths and they're using them to do a purpose, to send a message from A to B, send a text message from me to you, to send power along a wire on a power line. So they're very focused, they're very consolidated, and as a result of that, this radiation that bleeds off of them is much stronger, and it's all around us these days. So, very important difference between, between man-made and natural EMF. Shane, can I ask, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. It's so tiny on the bottom, could you just call out what the, the green square uh, circles are? Like yeah, yeah, so up here, you know, we have a, like a nuclear reaction. Okay x-rays, um, sunburn, visible light here, remote controls use infrared sometimes, um, microwave oven, cell phone, FM radio, AM radio. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> What's the person in the middle? This? Uh, radi heat radiation from human oh, bodies. No. Yeah, in the infrared window. Okay. So, I'm going to jump right to it. I think this is a really important question. Does EMF impact our health? And to understand that, there's, there's one concept that, that I want to take you through really quick. It's ionizing versus non-ionizing. That basically means ionizing can it heat something up. Non-ionizing it can't do that. This is a similar, it's kind of zoomed in on that, that last slide we had of the spectrum but it's breaking it out by ionizing and non-ionizing. So what the industry, you know, the electrical utility industry, the wireless industry, what they've said for years is all of our products can't heat tissue. So there's no concern here. There's no problem here. It's only this stuff, you know, that we all know, like too much ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays, things like that. That can heat your tissue. That can cause serious damage. <clears throat> So that's, that's a big uh, uh, divergent point here. And basically we're talking about a source of radiation hitting your DNA and causing damage. 
And this has huge downstream implications and effects on your body being able to be healthy, do things as it's supposed to. <clears throat> so the industry again has said for years, our stuff doesn't do this, so it's okay. But thank goodness for researchers like Dr. Henry Lai from the University of Washington. He's been researching and doing his own studies on EMF for decades. And he said, whoa, 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 no, that's not true. Non-ionizing radiation can also produce oxidative stress and DNA damage. And he's looked at hundreds and hundreds of studies and consistently found these effects um, in them. In fact, 82% of about 1,900 studies that he looked at of non-ionizing electromagnetic fields, he found significant biologic effects. So if anybody tells you non-ionizing, it's not a problem, that's sort of been debunked at this point. And in fact, this knowledge about EMF is not new. It may surprise you, it's, it's been known for a long time. This is a bad screenshot, I apologize, but this is a, a copy of a document from NASA in the 70s. They had gotten a hold of uh, a group of Russian research that had been performed even decades before that, like 40s and 50s, that had looked at EMFs on various systems of the body. You can see them here, dozens of systems. And the report is many, many, many pages long, and it found hundreds of effects within these various body systems. So NASA caught wind of this actually in the 70s and became interested. So this is not a new, uh, new deal. What does the title say? Influence of microwave radiation on the organism of, of man and animals. Yeah. Um, so research has kind of begun in America at that point and continued on. Um, I want to fast forward you to about um, 2018, and there's a prestigious research program in the U.S. called the National Toxicology Program, and at the time they were looking at what's now really old tech, but like 2G and 3G cell phones. They were looking at the effect of that on, on their uh, lab rats, and they spent about 14, uh, excuse me, they spent 14 years and 30 million dollars looking into this, so very detailed, very comprehensive. And they found clear evidence of cancer, heart, and DNA damage. Mm -hmm. And the cancers that they found were similar to what other researchers had seen with long-term cell phone users, so people that had used cell phones for 10 years or more. Um, so this was pretty, uh, pretty. Uh, it was a landmark study as far as this goes. Um, and then, like I mentioned, Dr. Lai, he's looked at almost 2,000 studies, so there's a huge body of research at this point telling us, hey, there's something here, we should probably be concerned about this. And all of this proliferation of these various types of radiation in the environment have led a lot of people to start experiencing what's known as electro-hypersensitivity, or EHS. It's becoming more and more recognized, uh, unfortunately, you, you probably still can't go to a traditional Western doctor and get any traction with saying, hey, I think cell phones are hurting me. But this is gaining more and more traction. There's some common symptoms listed on the screen, um, all associated with human-made EMFs. Many people reach a biological tipping point where they're living their lives, they're doing fine, they're in relatively good health, and then something happens, and they can't engage with the world in the same way that they did before. They can't have that cell phone there. They can't go to work with the Wi-Fi router. They can't go to the grocery store with the fluorescent lights. It, it can come out of nowhere for a lot of people. Your body has really good compensation measures, but there's a certain point, and you, you tip over that edge. Sometimes if you have a new bit of tech installed in your home, you get a new high-powered cell phone, you have an electrical contractor come out and do some work at your house, or the utility people are doing some stuff at the power lines at the street. These can all be those tipping points. Magda Havas is a, a PhD researcher, and her studies have led her to believe that around 3% of the population are severely impacted by EHS, to the point where they, they can't go out of the house, they can't hold a job. Uh, and about a third of the population 
is what she calls moderate. So they're experiencing some of those symptoms. It's not clear or obvious yet to them what it's from, uh, but in her view, it's due to this rapid expansion of technology in our lives. There's a couple of points here, of some of the ways that people are winning um, disability recognition and compensation against school districts and <clears throat> like a social worker there. Um, they've, they've been able to say, hey, this, this environment is making me sick, you need to accommodate me. And judges have said, yes, they need to accommodate you. And then Sweden, Sweden's been way ahead of the curve since 2000. They've kind of embraced this concept of EHS and accommodated their citizens in, in big ways. So all that to say, I think it's pretty clear that EMF is playing a big role in health these days. Uh, but I want to dial that in a little further, and especially with uh, the folks in this room and, and uh, your, your care and devotion to kids and protecting kids. Uh, kids aren't just little adults, right? And so they're actually impacted differently by this stuff. And we're going to get into that here. This is a, a great chart comparing different ages and how far a cell phone, for example, would penetrate into the brain. And you can see with a younger person, like a five-year-old, versus a 10-year-old or an adult, it's, it's penetrating you know, twice as much or more. And that's because children actually have thinner skulls. The myelination or the insulation in their brains and neurons, like the protection, isn't fully formed until 25. And also, kids, kids have a lifetime of exposure now, right? For most of us in this room, we probably didn't have any of this tech until we were 15, 20, 30, whatever. But you see kids now all the time, three, four, five years old at a restaurant with an iPad, or with mommy's cell phone. So they have so much more exposure cumulatively over their lifetime for those DNA breaks and damage to happen and for the body repair mechanisms to not be able to keep up and to develop, develop a cancer or something along those lines. So kids are definitely more susceptible to EMF. I love this chart. It's from Sam Milhelm, who published a great book called Dirty Electricity. And it's showing us uh, rates of leukemia on this axis and age one, two, three, four here, and then different decades. And as you may know, the electrification of the world, the, the bringing power to various parts of the world, started to happen you know, around the turn of the 20th century. Places like America got it earlier. and, and uh, more prevalently, but you can see as the decades go on, we see this rise in childhood leukemia. Uh, Dr. Milhelm noted that he saw similar in effects in the UK and in Japan, but not in Africa. And of course, Africa was not getting electrified at the same rate and the same pace as those industrialized nations. So this is a pretty pretty damning slide for electrification and the, the ills that can come from it. How about autism? Autism rate is now somewhere around 1 in 30. And while you know detection and reporting and some of those things have changed and been refined, it doesn't account for that big of a rise. Um, you know, there's some connection to vaccines, other environmental toxins, but what else has increased significantly since the 1960s? EMF. So I think that definitely plays a role here. Okay, even if you're not into the whole, I can't see this invisible energy, I don't think it's doing anything, there's pretty well-founded research into behavioral aspects from being exposed to tech. Behavioral, you know, ADHD, inattentiveness, um, screen time, and stress, anxiety, sleep issues, uh, risk factors for obesity and cardiovascular disease, depression, suicidal tendencies, I mean the list goes on. It's, it's a big concern even if you're not really sold on this radiation stuff yet. But the actual interaction between the device and the human and the psyche is causing a lot of problems too. This study over here looked at well, what happens to the child when it's born based on how much or, or how little the mother was using a cell phone during pregnancy. And 
high prenatal cell phone use was linked to hyperactivity or inattention problems, and no prenatal cell phone use was linked to very low risk <coughs> for any behavioral problems in a child. And this is really interesting as far as, as kids in tech, uh, but these articles have come out over the years from time to time saying that the people that designed and are making these products actually were very restrictive with their own kids on how much and when they could use them. So that really tells us something right there. Uh, Steve Jobs is not pictured in this, but I've seen similar articles about him and his kids. The creator of Facebook, his fanfic, his children aren't allowed to use it. Yeah. Let's end this section with a quote from American Academy of Pediatrics. I'll just read it. Uh, Children are not little adults and are disproportionately impacted by all environmental exposures, including cell phone radiation. Current FCC standards do not account for the unique vulnerability and use patterns specific to pregnant women and children. And it is essential that any new standard for cell phones or other wireless devices be based on protecting the youngest and most vulnerable populations to ensure they are safeguarded throughout their lifetimes. So the next question I want to ask is, is the government adequately protecting us from EMF? No! Oh, you guys have seen this part? <laughs> so I think this really sum, sums up the, uh, the government's idea of protecting us. Is we'll disguise it as a palm tree or as a pine tree, depending on your latitude. This is actually in Bend. This is a, across the street from an oh, elementary school. Yeah. Wow. Also, it seems like the government seeks out like the low-income housing and the schools to be like, oh, will you be our person that we can call here? Yeah. Well, they, they're, they'll pay you about $30,000 a year to, to put one of these. So, yeah, that can help a school that you know doesn't have a, a good budget going on. Um, we're at the top of the heap but not in a good way. In exposure guidelines, you can see the comparison here to other countries around the world, how much of this wireless radiation they are deeming as safe. And many other countries have decided that they should probably limit exposure and protect citizens, but not the US. It's so bad that a recent Wall Street Journal article estimated that around one in 10, which is 30,000, cell phone towers don't meet, as in they exceed the exposure guideline set out by the FCC. And so this obviously hurts unsuspecting residents nearby and, and school kids and even the people that go up on these towers, right, and do the work. Did you have a question? Well, related to that, what's happened in the last two or three years where you see one tower like the one in Bend, but now you see like four together? What, what is that and why, why is that necessary? Well, it's related to, that's a great question, it's related to the demand and all of this new tech and all of these smart devices, they're all taking up bandwidth, they're all trying to send and receive, and so the, the towers that were there only have so much capacity, so um, they, they need to put more capacity in, in the form of towers. And the cell phone companies are not very truthful about this, they're like, oh yeah, we don't have enough coverage here, so we need to put a few more in, so we're never quite sure what they actually need, and you really have to twist their arm behind their back. Yeah, and then there's multiple yeah. multiple providers, AT&T, T-Mobile, Verizon, etc. And then so. smart cities. The smart cities. Smart cities, yeah, we're going to get to that. But, you know, the government is, is really just not regulating this well. Closer to home, and, and we'll talk about 5G in a little bit, but 5G, part of it is to put small cell antennas very close to our homes. And this is an article I found uh, where they, I think, talked to some people from the real estate industry of America, and they've done studies on it. And having a cell phone tower close to your home, like this 5G tower, can drop the value as much as 20%. So that's a big deal for the American dream, and the home as the nest egg, and the retirement, and all that stuff. Um, the government's not not protecting us from that. So that, that's a 5G? That's a 5G small cell antenna. Yep. 
It's interesting that like the general population has a vague idea that they don't want that in their new home's yard, but that's sort of as far as they'll go. It's interesting. Yeah, cosmetically. Like it's a new <laughs> Yeah. 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 Just cosmetically. Yeah. yeah. Has anybody heard of Havana syndrome? So this was first reported in 2016 in Cuba, that's why they call it Havana Syndrome, where diplomats, U.S. diplomats, were reporting concussion-like symptoms but without any head trauma. And they couldn't figure it out, and these people had pain and ringing in the ears, cognitive difficulties, they could think, um, and, and other, other problems like that. So they started to look into it, and the government's been a little cagey on it, but what some people are suggesting is that they are using this type of wireless radiation like your cell phone uses, but they're using it as a directed type weapon. And when it hits the head, the frequency and the strength of it and whatever uh, tailoring they're doing to it, when it hits your head, it is actually turning into a shock wave, an audible like shock wave inside your head, which is creating those concussion-like symptoms without any physical trauma. Um, it's really concerning because some, some experts that have been interviewed on this have said you can create this type of weapon with off-the-shelf parts and you can fit it easily in the back of a minivan. So it's not some highfalutin government cutting-edge technology. Like This is basic stuff. Since 2016, it's been experienced in other countries around the world, uh, military personnel and their families. And nobody really knows who's doing it uh, or what, what's going on, but it's, it's pretty concerning that the government is kind of throwing their hands up. Like is anybody detected at all? Uh, that I don't know. It's, it's probably different than the type of pattern a Wi-Fi router or something would send out. So I, I don't know yet. The government's part of it. <laughs> yeah, and that, that may be a reason why they're playing, playing dumb on it. Uh, even worse, the people that share share this information. <laughs> I'm making I'm just I'm making a joke. I have worked with some I have worked with some targeted individuals, and it's, I feel like it is a joke. It's Make very real for them. Joke. Yeah. <laughs> What's even worse is that the government is also very overtly uh, telling us that hey, we can we have some technology that we can disperse a crowd with, or we can defend a a base with. Uh, it's called the active denial system. This is a real thing. You can look it up. Uh, it uses millimeter wave radiation, and it's supposed to not cause any injury, but just give you temporary discomfort. Uh, in my readings on it, a guy named Dr. Edward Wilson, who was a former <coughs> chief of the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington, um, he was talking about this program and he said, I did an extensive review of the literature and concluded that you don't get a perception of pain until some damage has actually been Ooh. done. So it's, it's probably uh, bogus that this is just going to bother you for a few seconds so you run off and not produce some sort of longer term effect. So any protection you could, you know, helmet, anything to help with mitigate that? Well, yes, there there is shielding, clothes, and that but kind of thing. But kind of... probably pick the protests you go to wisely, and don't <laughs> don't try and storm any military bases anytime soon. <laughs> okay. Um, further along these lines, so. Big Wireless, the wireless industry, I'll just call them Big Wireless. This was a great article in The Nation magazine. You can Google it, you can look it up, but it just in great detail unpacked how the wireless industry is pulling the playbook from Big Tobacco. Yeah. The stuff that Big Tobacco used for years. You know, denial, confusion, hiring experts, buying research, right? So the wireless industry is doing the exact same thing and creating that confusion and disinformation amongst us. Back to Henry Lai, another one of his research uh, studies looked at a, a couple of hundred EMF studies, but he broke them apart by those that had funding or relationship to the industry and those that did not. And <laughs> The non-industry related studies, they found a negative effect 70% of the time. The industry connected studies, 
They said about two thirds of the time there's no effect. So <laughs> come on, guys, what, what gives here? Pretty, uh, th that should make you scratch your head, definitely. <coughs> I've been really pleased to see um, some articles recently, and this is one from ProPublica, where the, the title says it all, it's a great article, you should look it up, but the FCC is basically shielding Big Wireless, right, because of all those lobbying dollars. And also because, this is a great book from a while back, telling how the, the fox is in the hen house. The FCC and the wireless companies have a revolving door people that go back and forth between them. So here's a couple examples on the screen, um, but this is really, really problematic too. Isn't it also the case that the FCC is like, oh, we're not a health agency, we don't know, it's not really our problem. Yeah, they have said that kind of thing. Thankfully, um, and there is good news, there's some good news tonight, you asked me about that earlier. Just recently, so the FCC had these this big guidelines in 1996, the, the Federal Telecommunications Act, where they established how much radiation is unsafe. Recently, they were up to have to renew that and kind of update it, but they didn't. And so a suit was brought to them by, I believe RFK was on uh, part of that. But they took them to court. The court slapped them on the wrist wrist and said that their failure to update was capricious and arbitrary, it was not evidence-based, and then now they have to come up with some reason as to why they're not protecting us. And, you know, it's, it's just kind of blows my mind because it's not like technology has changed much since 1996, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, it's pretty ridiculous. So, hopefully, they, they get more than a slap on the wrist for this and, and have, have some weeping and gnashing of teeth and have to, have to uh, explain themselves or up the guidelines in some relevant way. Is that the OTARD case? OTARD too, yeah. OTARD's over-the-air reception device. And it changes people's rights, like in an apartment building, to their neighbor, their landlord, being able to put some kind of antenna or transmitter there and it limits the, the people living there, what they can say, and what kind of notice they get, and things like that. Um, along the lines of good news, there's more. There's a lot of grassroots stuff going on, and, and I know all of you in this room appreciate the power of grassroots. Um, just recently, the, in the Los Angeles County, the wireless industry was pushing through a bill that would severely limit uh, the warning that citizens would get and the ability to appeal and, and things like that for placement of these new cell towers and it, it blew up and turned into a huge debacle and I think that's still ongoing uh, but it just shows you the power of when people stand up, raise their voices. Pittsfield, Massachusetts, uh, a new Verizon cell tower went in. All, all these residents in this neighborhood started having major health problems. They went to the city council. The city council issued a cease and desist order against Verizon which is amazing that they back, you know, the, the council back the citizens. Arthur Furstenberg, who's written a book called The Invisible Rainbow, absolutely outstanding book. Um, he lives in New Mexico, and he is working with a, a group down there to make it the first state to not have smart meters, smart electric meters. So that's, that's pretty amazing. You should definitely look that up and, and see if you can contribute or get involved. Um, and then closer to home, um, there was a bill a couple years ago called Senate Bill 283, which tasked the OHA with studying the available research on wireless, particularly as it pertained to schools and kids. And like I told you earlier about Henry Lai, there's, there's a ton of studies out there calling out issues. Um, but what the OHA produced was a sham. It was a complete turd. And it received widespread interna international criticism uh, but so far, the OHA has really gotten off the hook. They haven't had to retract it. Uh, so this is kind of a something that my group is keeping an eye on and, and trying to work on here. Uh, and this was a great article written about this whole debacle and all of the shady things that went on. I would highly recommend if you read one article that I showed tonight. But it's this, uh, Dan Forbes, he's the guy that broke the bullseye glass story some years ago. He was actually going to be here tonight, he had to cancel at the last minute, but it's a fantastic article. And 
the best news on this slide, Ashland, Oregon is on the cusp of becoming the first city in Oregon with real cell phone setbacks in their city ordinances. So this is, this is amazing and it would be so outstanding and such a great example if it went through. Um, along those lines, the nonprofit that I work for is called Oregon for Safer Technology. We are basically fighting on all these issues that I've mentioned, trying to raise awareness, trying to influence and educate lawmakers and decision makers, but we're all volunteer. We've been around for about 10 years, and uh, we have Martin Paul, who's one of the researchers I mentioned earlier, as our scientific advisor. Uh, but we're really trying to grow and expand our efforts and our reach, and so we could really use financial donations, we could really use, if, if you want to sign up for this email list that I'll pass around, uh, we could send you the newsletter and there might be ways to, to be involved and things like that. And also if you have skill sets, like you've worked on a nonprofit before, or you just have bandwidth and you want to get involved, you know, please, please let me know on that or, or come talk to me afterwards. But we're really trying to gain some traction this year and make some change um, in Oregon and, and make sure that you know, things like what's going on in Ashland can come through and, and other, uh, other efforts. So just a little bit on that. We're going to kind of dial it in now, get a little more practical. I want to get to telling you guys some things that you can actually do to, in your homes to protect yourselves and your families. But I, I need to take you through how do EMFs show up in a home, in your house? And so there's, there's four main kinds of EMF. They're on the screen, and not all EMFs are created equal. They all have different characteristics. They all manifest in different ways. We deal with them in different ways. So I need to give you a little primer on these different types. So the first one is artificial light. So sunlight is the gold standard, right? It's been around forever whatever you believe about evolution. It's been around longer than we have these kinds of things. And these kinds of things, these, these man-made bulbs are really problematic. Screens too, your phone, your TV, your laptop, they all emit an altered alien spectrum of colors of light. And they, they are really high in blue light, which is very activating. It's a very be awake, do awake things to your body. So it becomes problematic when the sun has gone down and the lights are telling us that it's solar noon. This is a, a big deal for your 24-hour circadian rhythm, your, your wake and sleep and light and dark cycle that's so important for maintaining health. These kinds of bulbs also flicker, and flicker is imperceptible to your eyes, but it's, it's linked with uh, headaches, migraines, seizures, if you took out your cell phone right now and did a slow motion video and then played it back, you would see the light doing this. Uh, and so pretty much all man-made bulbs have that. And also as part of their engineering, they produce what's called dirty electricity, which are high frequency transients. So uh, artificial lighting is really problematic and we, we need to address it just like we would address a cell phone or a Wi-Fi router. Are there certain types of bulbs that are better than others, or yes? Good I mean, question. We really did a deep dive into this. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, this is a very important topic. Um, they all have some kind of issue, for the mm -hmm. most part, but the good old-fashioned incandescent is the best of the worst. Mm -hmm. Generally, higher wattage in those has yeah, less, less of that flicker. You can't. Well, you can. It's hard to go to like a Home Depot and find them, but you can find them on Are Amazon. Are they being manufactured anymore, though? Yes, yeah, yeah, they are. You still, can get them. Because I thought they were. Yeah. There was some news, I think, with Obama trying to go the whole energy efficiency thing, and we're, we're getting rid of these bulbs, but they're yeah. still there. So, yeah, good question. Incandescent is the, the best of the worst. I and then say. what about like the red lights? Because yeah. you're talking about. Red. Oh, yeah. Yeah. red. yeah, right? Yeah. I have some of those, mm -hmm. but. They're also hooked to your phone so that you can adjust it, you know what I mean? Yeah, so they're, they're smart everything now, <coughs> light bulbs included. Mm -hmm. If you so get you just get a basic, yep, and you can go to like a party store and they'll have all, all different colors. Okay. The red is really good at night because it's like firelight, mm -hmm. it's not as intense and it, it's a different signal to your body. It's, it's more of the get ready for sleep signal. Mm -hmm. So yeah, red and incandescent. 
Recently, I got all into this Philips Flicker Free Eye Comfort Technology bulbs. And we had to like look into all these documents and like figure out what the hell was. It's not, the fl it is absolutely not flicker free. It's like way more flickery than, we tested them, we bought them and tested them, than yeah. incandescence. So the word, like the phrase flicker free, I'm like, how are you it's, allowed? It's just marketing, yeah. It's totally it's, wrong. It's garbage. Um, along the lines of artificial light, real quick, if you'll humor me, you know, sometimes with EMF, it's like, well, we can't, we can't see it can't taste it. Well, light, you can see, right? And it's a very in-your-face problem here. But this shows the, the lighting after dark over the last few decades, 50s, 70s, 90s, 2025. And in you know a significant portion of the country now, you can't even go outside at night and see the Big Dipper with your naked eye because of all this light. So it's really screwing up our circadian cycle and timing. Okay, so that's EMF number one, lighting. Now we're gonna talk about the EMFs that come in with the power delivery to your home. And there's two of them. The first is called AC electric. AC is for alternating current. That's the type of waveform power we get in this country. And if you think about this one, think of a soaker hose. It's a hose, it's pressurized with water it's not really spraying out the end, but there's that pressure and there's a little bit of bleed off. And that's what this electric field is like. So the metaphor extends to, uh, you know, if we had a lamp plugged in right here and it wasn't turned on, we would still have radiation coming off of that because it's electrically charged. So it doesn't have to be on to have this type of radiation. Uh, really, anything that plugs in in a power line can produce this. It's stronger if the voltage is, is higher, uh, but it's generally really easy to shield in, in the work that I do. So that's the first kind. Second kind is the magnetic field, and this is quite different. This is produced when that water is flowing along the hose. That's current. And anytime that happens, a magnetic field is created the laws of physics tell us. This is kind of what it looks like on a power line. You can see these bands of radiation coming out perpendicular. <clears throat> this one is really strong. It cuts through pretty much any building material and it can be very problematic to shield or reduce. So it's, it's another one to be aware of. <coughs> so those are the first three. And this is kind of the big tuna here. Radio <laughs> frequency or wireless. Before yeah. we get into wireless, I think you had dirty electricity uh, listed on your light page, but are you going to get back? I took dirty electricity out for, okay. for brevity's sake. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is another type of VMF that's kind of related to these. It's called dirty electricity. And it, when these radiate out, in the wall, you know, out of the walls in your house into the room, dirty electricity, which is like spiky noise, is also present. Uh, but I don't want to get too much more into that tonight. <laughs> So wireless, anytime you see radio frequency or RF, that's wireless. And that's a lot of things. Yeah? Can you repeat that last sentence from this like, spiky noise? Wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> just, just tell me what that word is. So if you think about um, an elect the electrical power to your home, it's a 60 hertz. It's a sine wave. So it reverses polarity. 60 times a second, it looks like a snake or a roller coaster. So dirty electricity is additional frequencies. It's like a roller coaster car on top. So it's extra noise that radiates out into the space. Have you ever felt it in your body? No. Do you feel like people can feel it? Like a wave? Yeah, oh yeah. Okay, because I do. Yeah. I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. I, I describe it like a, like, like this. Yeah. It takes the smoothness of that wave and it's yeah, really jaggedy and jittery. Yeah. Thank you for, sorry. No, not at all. Not at all. So there's many kinds of wireless. I've listed some of them up here. You probably know a lot of those, but you know, Wi-Fi, cellular stuff, Bluetooth, GPS, so many different forms of it. Smart devices are everywhere these days. If it sends and receives the signal wirelessly, this is what we're talking about here in this part, this type of EMF. Most of the homes I go into, I can find 15 of these things without breaking a sweat. It's just everything now is being produced with this capability. So you have to really be vigilant 
when you're shopping for a new dishwasher or you're shopping for a new thermostat. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a brain buster to think about, but this range of EMF, it oscillates thousands to billions of times per second. Right? And it's that really coherent, focused energy that's doing a job, that's sending and receiving a message. Yeah? Can you shut off the smart technology like on a refrigerator or something like that? Can you turn that off? It depends. Okay. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can, but it still transmits. You always, you always need to have your, your trusty friend by your side to verify. Um, and sometimes you have to what we do what we affectionately call voiding the warranty, opening up the device, cutting, cutting something, covering something. I had a client reach out who their landlord installed a new smart oven and they couldn't turn it off in the settings and this is an electrosensitive person and so they ended up actually having the, I think it was GE, the GE tech come out and swap the, the chip in the thing. So it's not always easy but you generally can do it if you get stuck with something like that. I have a question. So when you, you mentioned that you have to be careful of what you buy, how you're buying uh, appliances, what are I supposed to look at? Yeah. So if it says smart, if it says Wi-Fi, if it says Bluetooth, if it says here's a phone app that you can control it with, oh. any of that. Yep. And sometimes it's not right up front, so you may have to download the manual and look, look through it. So. Usually they're very proud of being smart. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so the old stuff there. Bluetooth! Oh yeah, right? That's wireless transmitting something. Yeah. yeah. So this chart, this ISOR, is the frequency allocations for the US. And this is for military, it's for consumer, it's for medical, it's for maritime, uh, aviation. But the point is, the skies are chock full air around us is chock full with a huge variety of this kind of radiation. Just smack full. Okay, so those are the four main types of EMF that we're going to find in a home and that we deal with on a, on a daily basis. There's one other thing I want to touch on, and it's the elephant in the room. How many of you have heard about 5G? Oh, it's the greatest thing. Oh, it's so badly. That's your I have a plus G. So 5G is, is the fifth generation of wireless technology. And you remember back maybe when your cell phone couldn't do apps. And that was a 2G phone. And then the 3G phones came out and then you could have all these cool apps and do things. That was the evolution from the second to the third generation. This is now the fifth generation. It promises really fast data speeds. It promises the Internet of Things. And what is that, you may ask? Well, it's, it's millions of new connected devices. It's these smart devices that we've been talking about. And I like to think of it as... You know, your fridge can now sense that the milk is low, you place an automatic order with Amazon, and the milk is delivered 90 minutes later by a drone. That's what we're talking about here. So it may sound kind of cool and interesting, but there's a huge downside to it. And I'll just unpack this here. So the way that the radiation comes out of the antenna with 5G is, is completely different than before. Right now, 24-7, it's just blasting out in a wide pattern. With 5G, we have phased arrays and beam forming, where the sensors, the transmitters in the antenna, can actually align and focus in on one person to send those high data speeds. And along with that comes very intense radiation. So that's a big problem. Millions of new antennas, like I mentioned, much closer to our homes and businesses. Um, <clears throat> the health impacts, the research is, is still being done. It's in its infancy, and this product is already being rolled out. There's no precaution here. We have no reason to think that it's going to be a benefit to our health, and some of the early studies are, are saying exactly the opposite. Uh, but, 
more research needs to be done before this is just steamrolled out. Ten thousands of new satellites, those are being put up into orbit every day, so that every square inch of the globe can be covered with this radiation and this connection. No chance for opting out or safe zones. Uh, really, really problematic. Data privacy. So all of these smart devices everywhere in your house collecting all this data about you. Well, where is that data going? Who has access? Did you give consent? You know, it's a huge problem. It's a huge concern. Software glitches and the hackability. So we've all seen those stories where the software on the autopilot and the Tesla miscalculates something and somebody gets run over. You know, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. The more and more devices that are computing and making decisions, the more chances for glitches and things to go wrong. The hackability, there's just a ton more opportunities for people to get in and do nefarious things with your information. So 5G is, is a huge concern, a huge problem. Yeah? Um, speaking about the bottom part, I can't really see it, but the satellites, was that for the Starlink? Starlink is one of a couple of corporations that have thousands of satellites up at this point. I mean, it's something that I've been thinking about this past year is who gave you know, Elon Musk approval to put hundreds of thousands of satellites in the sky, right? So obviously the government is involved. I've, I've been living in Mexico the last year and everyone is installing Starlink. Mm -hmm. And I just realized, like, that beam is coming down to their big equipment that they, they spent $700 for. And it's just, it's like a laser down to their <laughs> signal, and you're, there's no escape. Yeah. So, like, the towers, at least, you're like, oh, I can move away from it, or go out in the middle of nowhere. But now in the middle of nowhere in Mexico is now starting up. <laughs> yeah, if, if there's a Starlink receiver around, like when it comes out of the satellite, it's it's like a laser beam, right? But that laser beam over space okay, is going to expand. So if you're not super close, like your neighbor, you know, if, if you're close to your neighbor and they have one, you may at some point be exposed to that beam. So it, it has to do with your proximity and things so like that. So you think it's still proximity instead of just the globe? Yeah. Okay. I was just curious. But yeah, now that they're installing them all. We, there's an off-grid town that we've gone to a couple of times in a remote piece of Baja, California, in Mexico. And while we were at this, you know, unelectrified, like, hand-done hut yeah. in the middle of nowhere, they're like, oh, guess what? Two states installing Starlink. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, nothing is sacred. We nothing can't is sacred. You get electric. It's like an explosion down there with that right now. Yeah, because so. the, the other options are so poor and, and slow, you know, people want that speed. Um, What's happening in Portland with 5G? Are you going to get to that? Oh, we're going to get there. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. So, speaking of Elon Musk, um, even he, someone who's so pro-tech, someone who's rolling out these satellites, this was a tweet from him recently, but he's like, hey, this Internet of Things, this is a bad idea, guys. <laughs> So that should definitely tell us something. He's like, <laughs> like these things can all be hacked. They could be shutting down websites and causing mayhem. So we shouldn't do this. Um, okay. Let's talk real quick about COVID-19 and 5G. Um, there's a lot. A lot swirling around on this topic, and I thought I'd just share my perspective on it. This is a pretty busy slide, I know it's probably hard to read, but uh, Magda Havas, who I invoked earlier with electro-hypersensitivity, she and her team looked at uh, 5G deployment and COVID case and death rates. Mm -hmm. And she did a really good job, multiple linear regression to uh, take out you know things like air quality and socioeconomic and other things just really get to the heart of the matter <clears throat> and what it found is that with 5g exposure so places that had 5g when covid was going on cases and death rates were up 18 to 30 percent for states and up 39 to 57 percent for counties mm -hmm. so this is kind of a summary line for her but she said 
This assessment clearly shows exposure to 5G is statistically significantly associated with higher COVID-19 case and death rates in the U.S. Uh, the mechanism, should this be a causal relationship, may relate to changes in blood chemistry, oxidative stress, an impaired immune response, an altered cardiovascular or neurological response. So my take on 5G and COVID is, is not so much into the it was a government plot to use these two together. It's more like 5G is all of this new energy and radiation. It's on top of 4G. 4G hasn't gone anywhere. It's just adding in. And we already know that 4G and 3G and 2G can severely impact body systems, including immune systems. So more of this radiation didn't do anything for our immune systems, made us more susceptible to viruses and things coming around. So that's kind of how I look at it. And uh, I'd encourage you to look up this study from Dr. Havas if you want to read more. Okay, so what the heck do 5G antennas look like? Well, here's a few examples. This is a, you know, one of the big towers. It's called the Macro Tower. It does the 4G and the LTE. And these guys here, these smaller guys, which can be installed pretty easily in a lot of these towers, those are part of the, the mid-band 5G, part of the early rollout of 5G. This is in southeast Portland. That's by Matt's Barbecue Tacos, uh, or where it used to be. You can see the brown canister on the top, and then the brains of the system down mm -hmm. here. And then this was in Gresham, kind of a tripod thing. This is a strand mount antenna. Um, David, you were just in California, and you, you saw some on the, uh, was it on the light poles? Um, not on the light bulb, but it was on like a, uh, a pole. They had these things with like three things going down, three probes yeah. going down, and all kinds of um, things that are not here, like these, um, they had three of these um, kind of serrated um, cylinders attached to the huh. pole. Yeah, so there's a, a whole ecosystem of these things, and like I said, they're getting closer and closer to our places of work and our homes, so it's, it's just good to have your head up and, and be aware of the environment, and these things are being installed all the time. So what about the structuring of water? Can you do anything about that? Pardon? Because they're on almost all water towers. Mm -hmm. So the water's been restructured, but can you do about that? You can vortex your water, I suppose. <laughs> Filter it, get spring water. Yeah. I heard there's also some devices that help help with that. With the strut like I don't know, this one might be silly, but it's along the lines of those organ mm -hmm. organ things, but there's another someone was just explaining it the other day. They're like, Oh, I have it on top of my water tank and I feel like yeah, I think it's probably very problematic in general to drink city water. Um, so, but you can look, you can research structured water too. How do how do you know these are five G antennas? Is there some kind of reference thing somewhere that someone's doing? Are they just um, watching for the towers and making and seeing like someone go over there and install it, and they ask them the question like, "Is that a five G thing you're putting up, or how are they doing that?" Yeah, it's it's a whole combination of factors. I've gone out with a spectrum analyzer oh. and actually seen what what band it is. So uh, stuff like this is definitely in that mid mid band range. <clears throat> um, and then just the way the four G stuff is engineered, it's always been big compared to the smaller stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Right, because it's designed to transmit like all in all directions, whereas the yeah the five Gs. Yeah, specific. yeah, very different engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so, is five G in Portland? <laughs> oh. I'd say so. So, this is user reported data from nperf.com. It's a useful website. Uh, users with a five G enabled phone, when they get a signal, it reports back nperf, and so they've been able to kind of sketch out where it is, and of course these are kind of where, you know, transmitters are located, but it, it bleeds out for some distance depending on the, the wavelength, so really, you know, all of Portland has this additional type of radiation. Not now. very many in Lake Oswego. Hmm? Yeah, I have, I have seen, I don't know what's going on with Lake Oswego, but I've seen the small cells there, I know they're there. 
So I'm not sure why it's a black hole. Well, because of population. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't done that yet. So, so it's here. Oh, yeah, question. I just did this last summer. I was over in Portland, over by the University of, uh, University of Portland. Um, and they are literally putting them up on the power poles. And I'm, I'm curious, like, I'm just waiting for them to come around in these areas. But, like, how they got that on our power poles. And, um, you know, what's happening, like, in that one area, if they're trying something new. Um, I'm just curious about all of that. Well, they are very good at the zoning and permitting and greasing the skids, getting it through really quickly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I was saying earlier with, with the nonprofit I work for, you know, we're all volunteer. It's so hard to kind of have your finger in all of these cities and counties and, and be keeping your finger on the pulse. So, you know, we really need help. Um, people that can kind of be watchdogs and can look through permits that are being granted and there's there's so much to do because yeah they, they know how to get this through they know how to keep it away from the public because they've seen instances of the backlash in other parts of the country so yeah yeah there's all kinds of money behind this um, so these generations of tech take years and even decades to roll out and while it kind of looks bad in terms of the map I just showed you with 5G we we do have some time I guess you could say until the full feature set of 5G is where they want it so you know we don't want anybody to get super anxious about this I want to really encourage you to look at this as a time to get involved to write your decision makers legislators to talk to your PTOs you know, to help groups like mine, um, to have conversations with people, to do what we can in a grassroots way to bring awareness to this, and you know, hopefully even further pushing back against these cell companies. What's um, the difference between LTE and NR? Uh, it's it's new radio, which is huh. the new new structure, new style of the radio, the the transmitters on the antennas. What is the argument for 5G? Like, why do we need it? So we can download our movie in 2.3 seconds. Uh -huh. So it's only speed. It's not... Oh, there's it's, something more. It's the... <laughs> there's it's, more. It's this slide. It's That's the, what they sell you on it, I it's think. It's the internet of things. Too. Yeah, the convenience of it. To the convenience yeah. of everything yeah. being yeah. connected. Yeah. And yeah. Connected. It's it's just like yeah. everything. Yeah. Does anyone else 4G cannot do this. Does anyone else experience that... Their cell phone worked better 10 years ago? Because mine did. Yeah, I actually feel like I, I get calls <laughs> like, on this way. All my calls are not now. I actually pick it up every time I call it. Yeah, but it works so much better in 2010. But I'd rather be inconvenienced for safety. So, you know, they, they, every all these things, the, just like the, uh, the, the smart refrigerator, and everything, it's all based on, you know, convenience. Mm -hmm. and, and it's that's what that's how we're hooked, you know. That's how we're yeah. stuck. In. Yep. Consumerism, conveniences. Right. <laughs> so let's get to the good stuff. Uh, is there this is not the way to protect yourself from EMF, just for the record. Okay. I don't, I don't want anybody to do this. There's lots of good things that you can do and be a part of. And this might surprise you, but the number one way is remember those natural EMFs I mentioned at the beginning. Connect to those. Those will help you offset all of this crap that's in the air around us. So what are those things? It's, it's all right here. Sunlight on your skin, in your eyes, without bees, without sunglasses, without sunscreen. Bare skin connected to the earth. Water is a good way to ground to do that too. Um, this is it. And, you know, get outside. There's, there's so much good nature and, and natural EMF around us here in Portland. With respect to the sun, the sun gets a really bad name. Uh, I think it's the key to health, sunlight exposure. This is a study, they looked at 29,000 Swedish women and they saw how much sun exposure they had and then they compared it to the things that killed them. And those that had more sun exposure have lower all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality means dying from any cause. 
So, sunlight, you know, the more you get, the better you're going to do, is what this is telling us. Now, unfortunately, for those of us here in the Pac Northwest, we don't get the full spectrum sunlight year round if you're not below this 37 parallel. So, it's really good to budget and plan and take some trips to get yourself below that line, you know, as much as you can in the winter. Yeah, about five, six days we get full spectrum back here, actually, which is nice. It'll be pretty weak, but. Later in March. No, it, you'll get a you'll get a two or three on the UVI in a couple so that's days. That's the equinox. But, um, when, once the sun and solar and heaven, so once the sun is about thirty degrees off the horizon, the UVB comes through. Okay. Oh, mm -hmm. So the D minor app is really good for that. Yeah. 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 Totally. So I don't want to you know tinkle in your Cheerios or whatever, but there's there's still good. <laughs> good. That's not very professional. <laughs> I'm gonna edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> There's still a lot of good natural EMF around here for us, too. So that's number one, right there. Number two, the inverse square law. It sounds complicated, but it's not. It says that if you double your distance from a source of radiation, like a Wi-Fi router, the radiation that you're exposed to goes down by three quarters. So a little change in distance, big change in your exposure. So this really can inform us how we do things out and about in our house where we put things uh, and so on. So it's really important to get. Okay, for those of you that are wondering about crystals and pendants and dots and organite and harmonizers, there is no easy button here. Okay, I'm here to tell you that. Dr. Cruz is here to tell you that. Um, if those things worked like they said they did, the people that created them would have won the Nobel Prize because they would defy the known laws of physics. So. We want to do things that actually work on EMFs, like making repairs to the electrical in your home and changing your internet connection. Um, there's no easy button. So, so cages. Just so cages and shielding materials are that... are not part of this. Oh, okay. Yeah, those those actually are pretty effective. But putting a okay. putting a crystal on your table and then all the EMF in your house is magically okay for you. <laughs> that that's not a thing. It's not a thing. Sticker on your phone. Sticker on your phone. Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, but it's not. So the first part of this, you know, checking out your home, is to have your own set of meters. Borrow some from a friend. I think some libraries rent them, or get your own. I've got got some for sale in the back. But this is the key to actually knowing where the hot spots are, and if you make a change, did it work? Did it not? Okay. So. Check those out in the back. You can get hands on with them and try them out Does afterwards. Does that sound bad? Yeah. Is that bad? That's what I want to know. That's very noisy. It's not. <laughs> oh, bad. About 3,000 microwatts. Of like what? Wireless. Wireless. Yeah. That's so bad. We'd like that to be 10 to 100. Are you wireless right there? Or are you? Nope. Uh, wow. Never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> he wanders around with his own Ethernet cord. Everywhere. I do. It's like my it's security blanket. Yeah. Okay, my, my partner didn't want me to leave this slide in, but I had to. Um, you got to know what's going on around you outside your house. Like we've all these sources, power lines, small cells, smart meters, artificial lights, big towers, your transformer that you share with two or three other homes around you. These are all ways that EMF can come in. So we need to be aware. The more of these you have, or the closer some of these are, the higher your index of suspicion, and the more action that you need to take right away. So, this is number four, protecting yourself and your family. Number five, wireless. Wireless is so ubiquitous now, it's everywhere, and it, it needs to change. This is the biggest bang for the buck remediation you can do in your house, as far as I'm concerned. And the minimum starting point is to turn all this stuff off at night. Your cell phone, your Wi-Fi router, your smart thermostat, whatever. You don't need it on at night. It's not helping your sleep. The gold standard is what's called an Ethernet connection. Or remember the when we had to connect to the internet with wires? Yeah, it's that. It's faster, it's more secure, and it's much healthier. I have just published on my website a very long detailed article on all things Ethernet, what, what you need to know about it. 
what if you wanted to make the switch you needed to buy, how to DIY install it, everything. So check that out. Uh, but that's really the gold standard for wireless. I was surprised to learn, like, it seems obvious now, but when data is floating through the air, that's when it's hackable. And when it's like protected in a wire, they have to plug into the wired network. So, mm. yeah. so, so your Ethernet plugs into just a regular outlet? Nope. No. I'm not plugged into Ethernet here. Yeah, I need. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So Separate there's Ethernet there's adapters that go into your computer from the Ethernet, and that's all in that article. It's hard to find. Oh, I missed one. It's not on it. I have lots of Are there companies that are installing that anymore? Because yeah, they, it's, I, they're called low voltage companies. Okay. okay. Yeah, there's one one listed in the article. Okay. Good. Yeah. Sometimes electricians will do it. Sometimes not. So you said on your website, is this the website that has all the information about the? Uh, this is here. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Cool. Just go to the blog and you'll see it. Awesome. So early adoption, like I used to be that guy that was waiting in line for the first iPhone, <laughs> but that's not a good strategy anymore. That was before I knew any of this. Uh, but these devices are so high powered now and everything's coming with this smart technology, this wireless technology. Don't be the early adopter. You're just inundating your home with this damaging kind of radiation. Uh, one thing you can do is put stuff on a power strip like in your TV area, TV, you got your game console, your streaming device, your DVR, whatever. Put those all on a power strip, and then when you're not using it, just one button and it's all off until you go to use it, right? That's a really easy thing to do. Um, cell phones, don't have mine right here, but it should never be up to your ear. Never, ever. If you need to talk, speakerphone, set it on a table. Um, Air tube headsets, which I have for sale there. There's essentially a, a section of just hollow plastic here. So only sound goes up by your brain. So it's somewhat less radiation exposure. Wireless earphones, oh my god, those are the plague of our era. And those really are really good for the chemotherapy manufacturers. <laughs> those are really bad news. So if you have AirPods, sell them on Craigslist or burn them or something. And so airplane mode really, because I've heard these conflicting things saying, no, it can't be airplane plane mode. That's not good enough. It's something. like you're reading my mind. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, your phone can trick you. Mm -hmm. And it, these are three examples of, this is an iPhone, how you might think it's in airplane mode, but it's still transmitting, right? These are the, the main antennas on the phone. Uh, this here is how you would need to do it. Sometimes you actually have to go into the settings to get the slash. So Bluetooth? Okay. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, this is cellular. So, and turn them all on. Yeah. And unfortunately, if you have Find My iPhone on on newer iPhones, this won't even help you, even if you turn your phone off. Yeah. So. Anyway, uh, a word to the wise about airplane mode. So the places in our home where we spend a lot of time, the office, the kitchen, uh, it's really good to have a meter and, and to find the hot spots in there and figure out how you can change things, what needs to like be moving appliances, like moving your blender, it's, it's like just changing where your desk yeah. sits. There's so many things. Um, mm. Laptop, you shouldn't be touching it, working on it when it's connected to electrical power. Only on battery. And then when you get up to take a break, plug it in so that it's all ready for you when you get back. But when, when this is here, you have huge power system EMF coming onto your body. Uh, for computers and tech, there's really, really good grounding adapter devices that use the electrical ground in your home to your advantage. There's shielded power strips, and I have some of those things back there too. Uh, but there's really good options for computers and tech. Artificial lighting, you know, in these areas where we spend a lot of time in our homes, what can we do about that? You know, after the sun goes down, can we get some cool blue blockers? Can we use some red bulbs? Can we, you know, use, there's a software called Iris for screens which is really good in reducing some of these problems with lighting. But these are all things you can do in those places you spend a lot of time. The place that you spend arguably the most time is the bedroom. 
If we want to create a sleep sanctuary with as little electromagnetic energy as possible, so um, a couple of things, you know, the lighting again is huge. You don't want to see this kind of bright light within a couple hours of bedtime. Your melatonin release is delayed. Melatonin helps us sleep, but it does a lot more with scavenging cancer and things like that. So you want to limit your artificial light exposure before bed. Also social media, right? The behavioral aspects of social media kind of making us crazy and angry and heated or whatever it is. Um, it's not good. So you want to avoid that too. And then this, you know, the electrical around your bed. This is the bed of an eight-year-old child. Uh, and you can see the magnetic field is off the charts. And this is a, a bed map that I produced for the clients. And we discovered that the baseboard heaters, although they weren't being used, they were still powered on at the electrical panel. And this kid was having behavioral issues at school. They started turning the circuits off for the baseboard heaters, and this went into the green. The kid behavioral problems were gone. So this is like the campground experience. You know, we want we want that campground feeling, not the sore back, but the <laughs> I feel really rested kind of thing. And that that's how you got to get the energy out of the room to do that. Um, and again, no cell phones, no Wi-Fi, none of that stuff in your bedroom. So what about unplugging a power strip in your bedroom? Is that what you recommend? Just turning it off? So that, that would help like if you unplug things around, but you still have the wires in the walls, which oh. are doing the exact same thing. Oh, so okay. that's why we go to the circuit panel oh, and we find yeah. what, what's powering this room. And if you have a meter, you know, you can set it on the bed and trial and error your way through the panel to find the combination. So all of those things are, are all well and good. They're easily accessible. You guys could start doing them right away. There are deeper, you know, underlying causes of EMF problems. And that's where professional EMF services like I offer come in. It gets to the heart of the electrical issues. It identifies, you know, what kind of shielding do we need to do maybe from a cell tower. You'll get a custom remediation plan from me that will walk you through everything that needs to be done. I'm also available for consulting in a variety of ways. I do a lot of educational stuff like this. I'm active on social media, um, you know, YouTube videos. I've got a lot of those going on with tips and tricks. I have an ebook, uh, a newsletter. Thank you all for signing up. Um, but, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of trial and error your way through some of the tips that I mentioned. It, it can be a little much for some people. So that's why the, the easy button, the fast forward button is there. And grab a card, you know, come talk to me afterwards um, if you need that kind of help. And just wrapping up here, if you're looking for some reading and some ways to dive in on the subject, these are great. Just take a picture or you can review the video later. But these are all fantastic books that cover some aspect of the EMF issue. And I'll leave you with this. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. Right? So we all have everything that we need to thrive and to be well and to heal and recover and have good relationships and, and all of that. It's the environment that's the problem. And so we need to make changes to our environment, and EMF is a big part of that. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you.